Yes, hello. I'm Jason Lube, and this is the Ultra Culture Podcast. So, my guest today is the director Elias Marriage, who created the shocking metaphysical cult film Begotten in 1990, and the 2000 horror film Shadow of the Vampire, which was a fictionalized account of the filming of the 1922 film Nosferatu, starring John Malkovich and Willem Dafoe. Marriage also directed the 2004 film Suspect Zero, which focuses on remote viewing, as well as several shorts. He also did the Marilyn Manson videos for Cryptorchid and Antichrist Superstar, as well as music videos for Interpol, Danzig, and several others. We met recently at Century Guild, my friend Thomas Ngovin's art gallery in Culver City, Los Angeles, and we found out that we had a lot of interest in common, particularly around magic. Elias is a keen scholar of Hermeticism, Neoplatonism, Rosicrucianism, and magic, so it was kind of only natural that we would do an episode of the podcast and dig in further. Elias very generously invited me to his home, and we set up to record an episode in his impressive library of ancient hermetic manuscripts. Our interview touched on shamanic initiation, remote viewing, life after death, art as magic, and a whole range of other lovely topics. If you like this show, and this podcast in general, please support the creation of more episodes by checking out magic.me, my online school for magic, where you can take online video trainings in magic, meditation, and mysticism, and even get a free ebook on chaos magic. That's www.magick.me. Okay, on to the show. Okay, I'm sitting with the director E. Elias Marriage and his amazing hermetic library. We are surrounded by uh, hundreds or thousands of years worth of rare hermetic, gnostic, theosophical, and occult texts. He's shown me some things I've never even heard of, like uh, uh, both classic gnostic tomes and, and even things like rare finds like Florence Farr's original magical diary from the Golden Dawn, which I'm was completely floored by so I'm, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit in awe of the the books I'm kind of uh, hypnotized by the shelves here but we're going to talk about all kinds of even more fascinating stuff so how are you I am well and I'm excited to talk about these things that I care a great deal about well thank you for being on the show well, thank you for having me okay so we've we've already been talking for we've already been talking for about uh, an hour or hour and a half about about the Hermetic tradition and uh, Burma and and all of your 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 deep knowledge and interest of the uh, the Western tradition of magic and related subjects and so I feel like we've already kind of been in the uh, we've been in podcast mode for a while here but now <laughs> we're 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 dropping right into the thick of it absolutely. You know, I think for me, I I remember when I was seven years old being in a uh, newspaper shop in New York City, and I was with my dad at the time, and um, I saw the first issue of Man, Myth, and Magic. And in looking at that first issue, I remember seeing this beautiful and terrifying image of Pan on the magazine cover. And this is the one by Austin Spare, the painting. I think so. I yes. think so. Yes. And uh, it's it was it had such an arresting effect on my imagination at the age of seven that I had asked my dad to actually get the magazine for me, and uh, he picked the magazine up, leafed through it, and then he just shook his head like, "Absolutely not. There's no <laughs> way I'm getting this magazine for you." But that image seemed to speak to me about some essential truth in our nature, uh, a truth that you don't see in everyday life, in everyday uh, gestures of life. And I became very interested in things, not so much the things that we see, but the things that we don't see, the things that are speaking to us from behind the curtains of physical reality of um, our day-to-day reality. And uh, I became more interested 
in the things that take us out of the familiar. And um, I was very interested in the, in the sciences and in chemistry and biology from an early age. And uh, I remember looking through medical books. My dad had a huge collection of medical books, um, being a surgeon himself. And I was just transfixed by not so much the exterior of the human body, but the interior. And again, it ties back to that first issue of Man, Myth, and Magic. It's there are these realities that are just as real and palpable as the things that we see and touch. You just need to uh, cultivate the senses, cultivate that unique way of seeing in order to really understand on a deeper level, you know, these other worlds that cross-sect and intersect with our own, either through dreams or through meditation or for me as a child I was ill a lot so for me it was fevers that allowed me to sort of like um, look beyond the surfaces of things and behind the surfaces of things and 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 see a life force that is there that animates all these things and I became very interested in well what is this life force and I remember at the age of 16 uh, all the cast classes were canceled and um, in, in high school and because it was um, a huge snowstorm. And so instead of going home, I went to the library and I went to the philosophy section in the library and, and basically found, was looking for the most unpronounceable name I could find. <laughs> and okay. that name was Nietzsche at the time. And, uh, and uh, I remember seeing the title, The Birth of Tragedy, and I pulled it out, and I opened it, and I didn't put it down until I finished it. It was 95 pages or so. And when I read that book, it, it had such a profound effect on me. It, it changed my whole perception of what art really is, that art itself is a form of initiation, where you are initiating your audience into a way of perception into a way of thinking and feeling and acting that they would not normally have been privy to if they did not experience that particular work of art. So in Nietzsche, I was able to see this kind of like um, depth that we all contain as human beings that just needs to be unlocked because we're it's so easy to stay on the surface of things. It's so s easy to stay in the habit of things. And um, really, really powerful art is meant to sort of take you out of the habit of things, meant to take you out of the familiar and into the unfamiliar so that you understand your life with more meaning, more gravity, and more of a center as a result of it. Which goes back to the Greek idea of catharsis where you experience something that is so cataclysmic within your psyche that you feel like you are being ripped apart by this immense, almost toxic knowledge. But, but like homeopathy, great art gives you just enough of that toxin or that poison so that you actually heal through that experience. You come out the other side you know, more whole, less fragmented, more powerful within yourself. And I believe that in my search for knowledge and into the deeper nature of who we are, not only as biological beings, but as spiritual beings, that, they're, that the two are actually tied intimately together. And in traditional religions, I didn't find it's so explicitly spoken in those terms. But what I found in the alchemical and the hermetic tradition is that the, the very dirt of things yes. is part of the, its very beauty. That there is no birth without that dark, slimy, disgusting underbelly. And 
to understand that is to understand the basics of hermetic thought and alchemy. Right. And so you, you definitely see your, I'm, I'm wondering if you see your work as an artist and as a director of fulfilling that shamanic and initiatory and hermetic role for your audience. I do. I feel that, um, that with my first film, Begotten, there is very much a ritual that is being enacted. And for all of us in theater material at the time, that in making the film, I, I felt that the making of the film was the vital force of it all and the most important, essential, transformative part of making that film. And it was only that the actual recorded film, the actual film itself, that I then went on to share you know, with audiences, that was almost like the almost like the the smoke from the flame rather than the flame that that there was something about the m actual physical making of that film that had such a deep ritualistic initiatory quality that it left me almost in a depression afterwards when I was in post-production because I wanted to imbue the film with that same feeling I had in the process of making it in this very tribal way with um, a group of like really talented, amazing people that I was working with. And, and we all felt it because we were in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, I would use techniques in hypnosis and experiment with um, meditation to create a, a mental state from which the actors would sort of tap into this universal stream and they would act from out of that as opposed to trying to mimic anything that I could give them. Um, and it was a definitely a shared experience in that respect. And, you know, people have asked me where that film comes from, where it's inspiration. And I honestly, I wrote it when I was 19 and I think it really came out of um, all the illnesses and fevers that I had as a child were really instructive lessons and initiations into looking into these alternate worlds and multidimensional realities that are there and parallel with our own. And in that respect, I was open to this in such a way that I trusted it and was able to just record and sort of be a midwife and write down all these all these things that I was seeing and feeling and and not completely understanding on an intellectual and rational level. And sometimes when you create something, it's even better when you don't understand it, that you're chasing something that you almost cannot touch. And by in that very chase, you actually create something quite beautiful. Hmm. I've definitely, uh, in, in reading interviews with you, I've read you talking a, a lot about that group initiatory experience in creating Begotten. Mm. And Begotten is a very beautiful, deeply ritualistic film and very clearly, you know, without giving it away for people who are going to go watch it after this interview, uh, uh, deeply uh, conveys uh, uh, an occult or ritualistic uh, feeling. Um, but it, in, in hearing you, you talk just now, it seems to me like you've defined two very critical initiations uh, in the in the, the life of a, a shamanic or creative or magic magical creator individual. One being the childhood illness, which I certainly you know was the case for me as well. And I've read interviews with people again and again talking about having some type of childhood illness, which just for a brief period of time took them out of reality or took them out of the slow indoctrination process of childhood just long enough to show them that reality is mutable or is not what everyone else is slowly being encultured into or that there are other windows or possibilities and the second is that um, kind of late adolescence or early 20s group experience 
where it's either with an artistic collective or a group of friends, or it can even be, um, you know, uh, uh, group psychedelic experiences, but a certain um, period of time where there's uh, a, another window or opening or a hot spot or a creative um, circle or even a coven, if we want to call it that, that emerges for a few years. And then by the end of it, it seems to me usually one or two people will make it out with carrying the inspiration and the rest tend to fall off. But, but I've definitely observed that in my life and, and in many uh, friends' lives who are interested in this type of material. And uh, maybe people listening can resonate with that as well. But does that strike you as, uh, as, as accurate? I would say that our interaction with friends and other people, especially in adolescence and post-adolescence, that t- period just immediate to post-adolescence, is really a critical critical time uh, for me um, my closest friends were so unbelievably talented and were so um, creative that I would just be quiet around them and just listen to what they had to say about their experiences and and their observations they were also incredible um, experimenters in very heavy drugs and that was something that I never did not because I didn't think it was um, the right thing to do Uh, again these were my closest friends and they were all heavily into experimenting with some very very intense drugs Um, what's interesting is that they would always call me up when they were at the pinnacle of their high and they would want to get together because they knew there was something in me that understood something deeply in them and what they were going through at that moment, okay. whether, whether it was LSD or mushrooms or heroin. And, um, and I would have some of the most profound conversations with these friends when they were at that sort of apex of their high. Um, but I do agree that it's very hard to survive that, especially when you approach life with that the kind of vigor that a teenager does. Yes. And um, the only thing I, I wish for is that they had come out the other side and, and um, were able to artistically function and continue to function at the level that they were functioning when I knew them in middle school, you know, um, and I just saw a lot of damage there. Uh, but it doesn't always have to be that way. I'm just saying that um, that it was an Im- it was an important time, and and I feel that I was a person that w- trusted their unconscious. I don't mean my gut and my intuition. I mean I trusted that part of me that knows absolutely nothing and sees nothing that within that place there's all these voices and all these visions that you just need to physically and mentally and with your will pursue with everything you have and in doing so out of that nothing those images begin to arise those those ancient feelings and sources of feelings begin to emerge and endless doors start to open on a creative level and you just start becoming this uh, this being that is incredibly hungry and I think I think I've been hungry all my life and uh, that hunger has never been assuaged or gone away and now I feel even more force and fierceness and the things that I'm pursuing and um, and uh, wanting to bring into an image into a story into into something that becomes palpable 
you know, the idea of going out into the void, into the darkness, and and coming back with something that, uh, like a tribe, we can all sit around, listen to, or watch, and understand within our own being, you know, what it is that I am able to pull back. And I think that's what that's what we uh, all try to do when we're when we're creating something, you know, at least at at the highest level. That's what we're trying to do. That's definitely definitely describes the the ancient role of the shaman mm-hmm. as well. I'm curious hearing you you say that that process of bringing material out of the unconscious out of the void. Do you feel that that process is helped or or in in your in your case has that process been helped or or overcomplicated by the technical processes of hermetic magic and Kabbalah and all of the uh, diagrams and structures and numerology and, and linguistics and and all uh, the mechanics of it. You're talking about directly the, the tradition itself, these these traditions themselves, how I've um, been able to navigate through the symbols and the the rituals as the tradition dictates it? I guess what I mean is that Often the, it has, in my case, it has been, there's been a, a tension between directly engaging with the raw stream of conscious, of the unconscious and directly working with material, for instance, out of dreams or, or creative trances. And then the, and then there's the, the almost um, electrician-like nature of dealing with the Kabbalah and numbers and signs and that it's very, very uh, cut and dry and almost straight-jacketed in a way, but that there's definitely an in interplay between them. But for instance, you know, as when the whole chaos magic movement arose, uh, there was such this, uh, this huge trend of setting aside the hermetic tradition and saying it's just overcomplicating things. That's not really how I feel about it, but there's certainly been a trend of, of getting away from the structured way of doing it. And you're, t- you're, you know, we're sitting in a room full of hermetic texts, and you're obviously very, very interested in the technical side of things in Hermetica. So I'm curious how that interplays with the raw process of working with unconscious material. I would say that this entire library that we're, you know, in right now emerged out of the making of begotten that as you create you open more doors you invite more people people come to you and they 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 say that your work reminds them of some ancient egyptian myth have you read that myth and if i had not read that myth then it would be something i would pursue so i found that begotten became one of my greatest teachers in the sense that it would bring you know incredible minds um, to uh, to discuss and talk about some of the themes and some of the um, um, aesthetics that the film is putting across and I, I, I feel that I've learned more from more from begotten than than almost anything else I mean it's just it's been a magnet for uh, just meeting so many amazing individuals that are magicians or philosophers or linguists or artists themselves i find that it attracts artists and i feel that that to create to make something um is very close to the alchemical and hermetic nature of things that like like gods we create in order to inspire not only ourselves but to illuminate the darkness that that surrounds us at any given moment and the idea is that we we light these little fires in the form of a painting or a poem or you know a film or you know just being kind to others and um, and that fire is what is what illumines the darkness and 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 brings minds together in in ways that before would be considered impossible so i would say also to add on to that that i i spent time with the technical aspects of alchemy and um hermeticism and the kabbalah 
but I found that it would um, I, I found myself hamstrung with the technicalities and the specific specificities of the traditions themselves and what I found is that almost like blurring your eyes in order to see a three-dimensional work of art that is a necessary component to penetrating deeper into the alchemical and the hermetic traditions that you need to almost blur mm. your eyes you need mm. to understand intellectually and then blur that intellectualization of what you've just seen and then you need to begin to feel and then you need to feel a kind of emotion and then that emotion begins to build and that that build becomes a kind of will a new kind of will that enables you to penetrate deeper with greater insight into things that you had no access to previously and I find that this kind of like like flow and mechanization of the imagination um, through through blurring the mind especially when you're dealing with such heavy symbolry and imagery and emblems as is found in the hermetic and in the alchemical traditions that that there is a kind of um, weight that if you approach it from an intellectual standpoint purely with reason you are going to be confounded and disappointed but if you approach it vigorously from the intellect and then let go of that intellect something else begins to wash and blur into place and I found that you suddenly find yourself in a in other dimensions where you're able to perceive and feel these symbols as breathing portals to living spaces within our own cosmology as 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 individual beings and as a collective race of beings i love that i love how you just described that that totally rings true in my um and it's it was so succinctly put as well that totally rings true in my experience i often thought you know that the the magic eye of those magic eye paintings really are in a way the kind of secret to, to magic of of stepping back just enough and blurring the mind as, as you said to so that you everything falls into place and just stepping back far enough so that a it fall a you can kind of see it for the the gigantic beautiful metaphor it is and b so that you can understand that uh what you're looking for is coming from you from within yourself and it's being projected on the field of all this the magic theater of all these symbols and systems and diagrams and uh, then you kind of uh, hopefully step away from that experience you know understanding the the magic that's within yourself a bit more what i found in um in my hermetic work i rediscovered on a different level when i got into remote viewing and what i found in remote viewing is that to be an excellent remote viewer you you can't define what it is you think it is that you're seeing that the sooner you begin to define what you think you're seeing the sooner you will be totally wrong about what it is you're seeing the sooner you will not hit your mark and what I began to realize is that the longer I delayed beginning to think about what it is that I'm looking at and just worked upon putting the fragments and the pieces of what was coming to me almost like when you took an exam in high school and you felt like you were bullshitting on it that feeling like oh I'm bullshitting on this exam and I don't know what I'm talking about that's the feeling you want when you're remote viewing that's always when I wrote my best essays exactly <laughs> well I think that's when you I think that's when you do your best work you know and and interestingly enough that's when you are the most successful and at your height when you are remote viewing when you think that you have no idea 
and no semblance of order to the data that you are writing down or drawing in front in front of you and you are not applying your your rational mind to creating a, a picture out of the gestalt of what it is that you're you're sensing because then that gestalt will totally disappear and you will no longer be you know tapping at the source of what it is you need to be tapping at in order to successfully see that remote viewing session through to its end okay so i'm obviously fascinated by this i've never done remote viewing i've met people who were involved in it um how would you how would you describe what remote viewing is and, and how did you get interested in it that's a pretty that's a pretty intense and uh and mysterious thing to fa find yourself falling into i got into it when um i was I got into it actually many, many years ago. I had read about it. I had read an article that it had been declassified um, from a top secret program that the Army had financed in the 70s. And what the Army basically did was they were exploring uh, if, if it was possible to teach a soldier or someone in the Secret Service how to behave psychically to understand things by not being directly in contact with it like to actually visualize where a hidden target might be even though there's no map and there's no data from any satellite on it and um, what the army did is they they hired they found two genuine psychics one was a uh, man, very gifted psychic by the name of Ingo Swan. Yes, yes. Um, I've read his stuff. Yes. And this was Operation Stargate? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. And, um, and Ingo was able to study his own mind and how it worked when he, his mind was behaving on a psychic level, at a very high psychic level level and able to draw into himself knowledge of things that would otherwise be impossible to have any you know knowledge of um, and uh, what he did is he created a number of protocols for beginning to see things using nothing but the mind and uh, the protocols seemed arbitrary and strange, but they work very much along the lines of, you know, when you look at those grimoires from, um, you know, the 16th or 15th century, you know, the Book of Solomon, or you look at any of these grimoires, you see sigils, and those sigils are actually touchdown points for an entire multi-dimensional realm being brought into this three-dimensional space and time. And you actually, the first thing you do when you are remote viewing is on your piece of paper, you create a squiggle, like an ideogram, which is very much like a sigil. And from that ideogram, all the information comes out from that ideogram. That, that ideogram is a tear in space and time that enables you to peek through to a place on the other side of the world or another side of the galaxy and to look at things. Now, of course, something on the other side of the galaxy, it's impossible to prove what it is that has been seen there. But some of these experiments are just so courageous and so wild. They remind me of you know, the whole effort to go to the moon and all those moon shots and the courage of those those men, those people to organize that something so crazy using science to do it, you know. I know that some of those guys like uh, Edgar Mitchell was very involved in remote viewing experiments and Yes, and he has the things. he has the um Institute of Noetic Science. Yes. Up in uh, Marin County. Yeah, Petaluma. Yeah, Petaluma, exactly. And I was actually up there 
um, I was I, I made a uh, documentary on remote viewing that's part of the DVD for Suspect Zero because okay. I found I found it important to try to educate you know people or at least give people access as to what remote viewing is. Um, and I had interviewed Dean Radin, who was doing a lot of experiments in non-local consciousness, and um, and that's how I uh, and they're doing a lot of great work up at that um, institute noetic science yeah i think every you know like going to the moon you know it it's like deep meditation or a cataclysmic experience in your life can lead you to a great illumination that that horrible shit that happens to us sometimes can lead to the greatest treasure of knowledge that anybody could ever wish for and it's about being open and being courageous in those moments where you feel the most fear that enable you to see beyond your own personhood beyond your own being into the greater being that um, I- is constantly informing you and constantly informing us on a very inexplicable level that is both sublime and terrifying you feel that those moments are are in their own way like you've just described moments where we're pushed out of our own way without a doubt you know for me i i had a um I, you know for me one example i mean i've i've almost died many times in my life but but one of them was um in this auto accident on the west side highway in new york city at 2:30 in the morning and a cab had cut off our very small, econo- uh, you know, this very small car, this Le Car by Renault. And the car spun, hit the guardrail three times, and the engine came through the dashboard. And I was wearing a seatbelt. I was in the passenger seat, but I stopped breathing and was pushed out the side of the, the car door, hanging on the strap of the, uh, of the shoulder strap. And my friend, who was, we were going up to Columbia uh, University, my friend was a pre med student there. And um, he started actually doing CPR on me because I had stopped breathing. But that experience was one of the most life-changing experiences of my life because I started to sink into a vision that took me on a journey through all time and space. And I started to see that everything, that there is no such thing as the past or the future, that everything is intimately, you know, woven together and connected. And it all made sense in this in this state. And I remember uh, my friend, uh, you know, wh- wh- what happened was I had an ear in the real world, but I also had an ear in this visionary world where I was just being brought on this journey, like moving through this forest where there were all these gods that some of them were melancholic, despondent, like leaning against trees, like in their own thoughts. And I was just going through this forest and then off this cliff into ancient Egypt and what felt like some ancient race that I, I, I don't I even, I don't even think has been, you know, cataloged. And, um, and I tried to bring as much of that knowledge back with me when I um, when I came back to consciousness, at, at, you know, in the um, in the hospital. And um, what was so extraordinary about that event is that there were a group of homeless men who were in the woods that had that had come out and were trying to explain to my friend that I was dead. But in fact, I was traveling and I was learning so much a- at that exact moment. And these these guys proceeded to take my boots, my wallet. This is in the physical world. In the physical world. Stuff. Okay, and wow. my, my, wow. my, my leather belt. Huh. You know, just like ordinary things. But in a way, it's so perfect because it's like your identity. Yes. You know, it's like your wallet's gone. You know, your shoes are gone, so now you're connected. You're like, 
naked connected to the earth that seems very much like an initiation where you're and i that's the way i look at it yes like these homeless guys were like these high priests unconsciously you know initiating me into this new vision this new or i should say ancient vision that i just previously was unaware of and that just I, i remember waking up on this metal table in this um, in this uh, in the emergency room of the hospital and I remember hearing the most gorgeous sound of angels it was like the most beautiful choir had been organized and as my essence was coming back into the dendrites and nerves of my brain and my brain was starting to wake up and become material again and start to work again. Suddenly, as I started to come into my body more, I, the, that choir of angels turned into the electric wiring in the entire hospital. And I could hear the entire electrics going off and going on inside the walls of the entire hospital. And that was like a f- more frightening, more discordant, you know, more terrifying sound. And then, and then finally, as I sank back into my body even further, I could hear the little static noise, like a snare drum, in, but very small, in the, in the observation lamp that was just above my head, that was just staring down at me. And then I opened my eyes, and it was, but I just remember thinking, the first thing I wanted was a pad and pencil or some recording device because all of the stuff was there, you know. And I was able to write down maybe 8 to 10% of it. How did the world look to you when you came back? Oh, the world looked so painfully slow, so lethargic, so, so dumb and mute and full of just... just nonsense it just it just it felt like oh my gosh this is really not the nature of things that the nature of things is so much faster than the way we move that we are actually you know i know this sounds very gnostic but we are actually imprisoned in in matter in some ways and 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 also liberated in other ways i mean we need we need our bodies to perceive we need our bodies and i I don't think that if I didn't, if I didn't have a body to, to, to suffer and go unconscious, then I wouldn't have had this vision. So, everything is related. You know that, like whether you want to call it um, divinity, divinity is in matter. It's not somewhere else. And matter and its masks are all the surface of things. But as you go deeper, whether it's through whether it's through illness or whether it's through initiation or whatever it might be, as you go deeper into your body, you go deeper into your cells. And by going deeper into your cells, you go into that ancient place that bypasses the mind and bypasses you know, your sense of self and ego and takes you into a, a much wider sea that is, to me, much more exciting much closer to, you know, you look at um, Homer's The Odyssey or something, you know, it's just, that to me is the noble expanse that we each contain within ourselves. So I'm curious. And the hermetic and alchemical traditions are portals yes. and ways into that. Yes, absolutely. I'm curious, although anyone who's had experiences like this sees that this is the the sea that you talk about (coughs) is something that everyone is a part of and everyone has access to this why do you think that only certain people are interested in going into it whether they're artists or religious or shamanic figures or are perhaps um, is that the job of some people in society to fulfill that role 
well, why do, why do only some people seem interested in this and others, at least to us, seem to, or on the surface, seem to be only interested in the tangible, the material, what's on their phone, or whatever it is? Well, I think life in the body is very much habit forming and most almost every life form chases pleasure as opposed to pain and you know illness is not something anyone really wants or looks forward to that was that was my path at the time and I feel that there are many, many paths to this deeper nature of ourselves. Um, and I, 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 but I do feel that, that suffering is, is an essential part of philosophy and knowledge and illumination. Certainly, um, begotten makes that very, very clear. Mm. Uh. And I believe that, uh, you know, in many ways, begotten on a very fundamental chemical level is about the suffering of matter itself, the, the, the birth and eventual entropy of, of every living form, and the sadness and the beauty of that is somehow captured in that film and I find that um, the most vulnerable and delicate things are also the most powerful things and the most inspiring things I don't think that um, fortresses are very interesting in that respect how do you mean fortresses? I like li literally fortresses. I think that either fortresses where whether it's I think I think it's uh, what I want to say is that most of us create fortresses around ourselves to make ourselves um, no longer vulnerable no longer um able to hurt and I feel that it's actually the opposite that by opening yourself and allowing yourself to be to be vulnerable is a way of both engaging with life and learning from life in in a much fuller way what would an example of that process look like or if you can think of a specific time uh, that illustrates that. Using the auto accident again. Okay. I found that rather than be scared in my unconscious state, I became, it's almost like a, it almost became like a lucid dream, but a lucid dream that carried with it the weight that it wasn't a dream, that this was something actually real. And I became more curious and more excited by that than I was by my own life that somehow it seduced me it got me so interested that 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 vision became more important than my own safety and I know that sounds counter to the way most most of us want to protect ourselves from harm but there was just something in that that became such a huge lesson for me about the nature of things that that by being open to things and not being afraid by being open to it and or or being so afraid that you go beyond your fear into something else where it takes on like a whole nother level where where fear takes you to a place that vacates the rational mind entirely and allows the cellular mind 
to just sort of take over. And that cellular mind is really where the ancient wisdom is contained and where, you know, the alchemical and the hermetic traditions draw themselves out from. For me, the certainly the the core of magic or, or technical ritual magic, particularly chaos magic, is engineering windows of getting into that space, whether it's, like you said, through, you know, through the sensory overload of the body in one way or the other. Um, and uh, in order to allow a window where you, you're outside of yourself. Um, but, th uh, but then the, the uh, second component is bringing, as you've, you've already touched on, bringing something back. And that's, that can be harder than getting out there, bringing something back and reintegrating it with the personality. That's tricky too. Um, that's the toughest part. Okay. It, it really is the toughest part because kind of like anesthesia, it's hard to remember anything from that experience of general anesthesia. But I've had experience with general anesthesia, you know, having uh, a number of complicated surgeries a few years ago that have then resulted in me being healthier now than I've ever been in my life. So it was a good thing. And, but I found that surgery itself is a kind of initiation, is a, is a way into not only being penetrated on a physical level in, in ways that we don't normally experience as, as living beings, but also the, the idea of anesthesia itself, the idea of... Um, moving your mind, your soul, your essence to a safe house, a place of safety while your body is being torn open is quite an extraordinary thing to think about. And I remember what I would do is as they were putting me under an general anesthesia, I would try to, as long as possible, perceive and apprehend everything that I was perceiving at those different levels and stages as you drop into that delta zone of brain activity. And that's a whole other uh, thing, you know, where you have like, you know, alpha, beta, and theta, and delta waves in the, in the mind, in the, in the brain activity. And, you know, the delta is like that unconscious black void of a place that no one knows what goes on there and I feel what goes on there is very much what we find in the deepest of hermetic knowledge which is that in that delta zone of brain activity is that cellular ancient place where you go back to the very first cell that bubbled up from that ancient miasma, that slime from the ancient earth. And um, I find it all so beautiful and amazing to like really think about because you start to understand your ancientness on a level that is no longer about life and death. It's about these these greater cycles and and as you know as a magician those greater cycles the more you understand these cycles as cycles the greater the efficacy of your magic is whether it's the lunar cycle the solar cycle the solstices the equinoxes the dark of the moon the, the full of the moon all these are very powerful periods and moments from which doors open and doors are closed and portals are opened and portals are closed and knowledge is available and then it's not and that in itself is just so just huge and gigantic to wrap your head around that's a lot of stuff 
and yeah. and also just watching the patterns of people you know the patterns of, of of human culture and civilization and why people do the things that they, why people do what they do and the the human pattern like the the pattern of the human animal and how it's kind of the same throughout history that for me uh and for me it's not even about technical magic at all i think manly manly hall talked about you know, a philosopher is somebody who looks at all these patterns to try and understand reality, and a magician is someone who tries to manipulate them. I'm much more interested in just understanding them. And for me, the more one, you know, and the symbolic language of Hermeticism and Kabbalah really shows you that, but I think that the more one understands those patterns, the easier life gets, or not necessarily easier, but life gets, uh, it makes sense. You kind of stop bumping into the walls that's a good way of looking at it because really the lid is off the jar once you start to understand things and instead of feeling like a fly inside a contained jar you realize there's no limit to how and where you can fly and that is the th that I mean that is the great reward of uh, initiation and using your will to pursue the unknown and to pursue those seemingly empty spaces and find them full once you've become initiated into that emptiness, that space that seems to hold nothing, yet everything becomes known. Right, right, right. And I, it feels like to me, I mean, when you quest for the unknown, like, like you say, eventually the unknown becomes the known and then eventually the known becomes the understood and then eventually the understood just empties out into nothingness as you say or empties out into a great work of art okay okay and and the forms that you see emerging or that are that are condensed into art it's almost like learning the it's just learning the language of reality so you can talk to it just like it's like learning French or something like that or learning computer programming or learning music okay you know the thing I find so extraordinary about music is that it seems to draw from that emptiness and give it a voice and give it color give it shape and give it sonic geometry and the beauty of musical notes is that they're born and they decay almost instantly as soon as they hit your ear. So their lifespan is just so unimaginably short, and yet the impact is so imaginably, you know, massive on the way we think and the way we feel. I mean, imagine going through life without music. Right, right. And I'm not a musician, but it's amazing how many how many musicians Im immediately intuitively understand this stuff and the ritualistic nature and the performance nature and the intuitive nature uh, of the magical process and how many artists uh, of all types immediately intuitively understand this and that's fascinating to me to see and but also um, the people who are coming from a deeply rational place often become very, very interested in, in this material, like uh, uh, financial people, for instance, or uh, computer programmers. So, it, but, you know, it's kind of like it has something to say to people of all, all different. Uh, uh, Without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, uh, intellectual or, or emotional or, you know, different types of character structures. Yeah, I don't know, I mean, I think there, I don't think there's been a civilization on earth that hasn't used astrology or divination in one form or another. I mean, remote viewing is a form of divination and that was something that was created by the American military. So all that said, and, and even knowing that for instance, things like the remote viewing uh, program existed or the, uh, um, 
the what was the Earth First, the Earth Battalion, or First Earth Battalion, or the thing that's talked about in John Ronson's book, uh, The Monasteric Goats, right? Or the fact that uh, Nancy Reagan used an astrologer, uh, or the occult connections with MI5 and MI6 in World War II, like Crowley being used by Ian Fleming, or with all these things and in and Wellesley Tudor Pole's works that I was yes telling you about, and it's just an amazing. Uh, history uh, just in our own time of how these things interweave with our society so with all that being said and and seeing as we do how all world cultures have deeply been enmeshed it's just part of human existence throughout all cultures why do we still have this attitude of it being taboo or childish or unspeakable or or something for uneducated people or lesser than our kind of intellectual materialist uh, because worldview. Because people in general don't trust what they can't taste, what they can't see with their eyes, and what they can't hear with their ears and apprehend with their senses. And it becomes too scary for them to imagine an unseen world that is populated by, you know, forces that are beyond any kind of language or any kind of explanation other than to um, experience it directly and then take from that experience and turn that experience into a language, that language being a piece of music, that language being a work of art, or it being uh, a piece of architecture. Do you think that our culture uniquely has an antagonistic attitude towards the esoteric? Uh, and is that changing? That's a really good question. Uh, no, I don't think it has an antagonistic position towards the esoteric. As a matter of fact, everything that's happening right now with the human genome and everything that's happening right now in physics and astrobiology and is more alchemical and more mystic than than anything. I mean, look at the atomic bomb, for example. You know, uranium, which is at the heart of the atomic bomb. Uranium is created and formed not by exploding stars, exploding galaxies. I mean, we are talking about ancient stuff. Galaxies that used to exist that just through chain reaction just devastated the, itself. That remain, an aftermath of that, condensed itself into what is in our own Earth and in our own stars as uranium and uh, the idea that human beings were able to take that ancient stuff like billions and billions of years old and reignite it almost reenact the, its birth by causing that chain reaction to to ignite into a a sun in miniature over Hiroshima and Nagasaki is is horrifying and at the same time extremely magical. Yes, and I, I think that anyone who's uh, has a holistic or hermetic worldview or magical worldview like you know like we're discussing right now will clearly, understand you know have that type of overarching understanding where they see how all these things are fit together and are a part of a larger process well, uranium is like an ancient hermetic symbol yes suddenly that hermetic symbol was found studied and gifted men who like Oppenheimer like Einstein and a number of guys that in Manhattan Project they were able to unlock this symbol and return it back to its origin, its original birth and creation, 
was out of something that was even larger than any nuclear explosion we could ever imagine. And they were able to take this symbol and energize it again with its own beginnings by causing that chain reaction to occur and finding the secret to how to make that chain reaction occur. It still makes us barbarians, <laughs> but, but on a whole nother level. <laughs> And I think that savagery and in, in that savagery and that hunger and that thirst for knowledge is so intense in human beings that we would, you know, we will risk destroying ourselves to to unlock the mysteries that are there in nature and unlock the mysteries that are within ourselves. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's mind-boggling to think about the advance in human knowledge over the last hundred years, and certainly to think about that in alchemical or hermetic terms. Yet at the same time, if we were to go out to the Richard Dawkins of the world and talk about ma the idea of magic or hermetica or the idea even of any type of subtle force or subtle energy or subtle nuance or metaphorical nature of reality, Y we would immediately be met with, you know, a brick wall or iron curtain of, you know, iron wall of, you know, no, that's, that's not reality. Right. And even though there is such a, it seems to me this, not just the religious impulse, but the mystical impulse seems to be hardwired into, into people. We definitely occupy a period in history where it has been severed from the official narrative of what reality is and not even and very much pushed to the margins even though it's at least in my opinion uh the core of western civilization that you know al the alchemical tradition is responsible for science and directly responsible for um you know the traditions that led to the manhattan project or any of these things that we're talking about that's a direct line of of intellectual tradition and uh, tradition of I um, oh. insight and experimentation with reality. Uh, you know, that we, we owe our current scientific understanding to the al alchemical tradition, but yet at the same time, the parent tradition of alchemy or hermeticism has been not only pushed to the margins, but severed from the official history and severed from the official narrative of of where our culture came from and what it is and that to me is a real tragedy um because well i know that einstein in his um in his beginnings he would have a group of friends that would come to his apartment this is before he had um come up with his uh theory of relativity in 1905 and they would have talks and discussions on everything from Giordano Bruno to Da Vinci to, you know, Ficino, Ficino's idea on, on talismanic and sympathetic magic. I mean, these were things that Einstein was, was steeped in. I've never heard that before. And, and, huh. and Newton, as you know, wrote over a million words on alchemy. As a matter of fact, to Newton himself, he did not see his accomplishments in calculus as being anywhere near as important as, a, as his accomplishments in alchemy. He felt himself more successful in doing more important work in alchemy, which was hidden by the scientific community for over over a couple centuries why though that's that's what i, I really want to get to the core of this why is it why because is it hidden why is it severed because human beings can't cannot understand how a totally what seems to be a totally irrational system of apprehending reality can somehow hit the bullseye it's something that 
we as rational beings need to explain our way out of every situation okay whether it's you know why we had an affair or why that politician did what he did okay you know, we like to rationalize the fact of the matter is that there is almost nothing rational about life there's no one on earth that knows why they were born what purpose they were born for and what it is they're here to find out everyone is in the dark that is the foundation of our existence and the more illumined ones whether they be from the east or from the west they understand that the greatest of truths are those things that are so beyond language and beyond rational thinking that they are like a light or an invisible sun that shines through all the physical things we do, whether it be language or whether it be the things that we think or the things that we interact with or the things that we create. The sources of everything we do, including the way we speak to one another, the gestures of our faces, the way our eyes glance, the way our pupils dilate when we speak, comes from a furnace of irrational fierceness that if we were to confront it directly would scare us to death. <laughs> As beautifully put. Yes. Wow, okay. So with that said, the hermetic dictum of silence, right? The idea that these things should be kept hidden. Is it more that they can be openly expressed and that we can hopefully wait for people to be less afraid or what where do you where do you sit on the um the the hermetic silence issue i think all great things are born out of silence out of that void that we need to penetrate and willfully seek out in order to bring images forth from that void from that place and i think the most essential parts of our lives come from that place the moments that mean the most of uh, to us those epiphanies in life come out of that that silence that space and become vocalized in these sporadic moments within our own existence unfortunately for most of us those moments are few if any and uh what the hermeticist tries to do is cultivate more of those in their lives, more of those events that lead to these epiphanies, that lead to an illumination of the void, the illumination of that darkness, so that people become less scared. And that is the point to initiation. Initiation is to make you, is to turn your abject fear into wisdom. Yeah, I love I love how you just put that. I feel like certainly uh you know, the artistic process, all great art in you know, from reading biographies of artists or or engaging in the creative process, definitely the that place of silence or getting out of one's own way is where the true creativity comes from. But certainly also if you read the history of science where great scientific discoveries or insights or epiphanies come from and I think that um, obviously meditation is a slow way of inculcating that place of mental silence and being able to regularly get it, get out of your own way. But I feel like magic is great and magic and initiation are great because it's more like shock tactics. It's like arranging a short window where you shock yourself into an altered state or getting out of your own way. And because of that, I feel like it's very well suited to our current culture, time and space where people are very time pressed and very attention deficit uh, distracted and very going from one thing to the next and the idea of cultivating meditation and maybe in in 10 years i'll be able to you know might be able to enter delta states or or other brain states on a regular consistent reliable basis while that may be the the much more core healthy quote-unquote path it seems like the idea of 
the temporary shock tactics of magic become much more uh, suitable and attractive to our current culture, it seems to me. Uncertainty is the only path that takes you to knowledge. As soon as you're certain about something, you've already closed every single door and built walls around that certainty. And you become complacent and you become you become almost arrogant in that little room that you've created for yourself. As soon as you knock the walls down and see the wider scope that is out there in infinitude, there's a kind of melancholy that begins to take over. There's a kind of uncertainty. You become less confident you become more open, you become more vulnerable, you become more sensitive, and you come much closer to the truth. In your life, what have been the, your best methods for knocking those walls down? Never getting too comfortable in the things that I think I know. Never getting too confident with a particular cosmological insight that I think is absolutely true. And being able to listen to everyone. And I mean, listening means looking at an, a painting that I normally wouldn't go after or look for um, or listening to a piece of music that I'm not normally comfortable listening to or just listening to a stranger someone that I don't know and sometimes great truths speak across time through accidents and conversations that occur in the most unexpected ways. And I guess jazz musicians really capture my admiration in the sense that they're open to that void and they're constantly giving voice to it with their instruments and their improvisations. And I think that's the best of who we are. That's the best of generosity within ourselves we that that we're able to to build out of nothing something so so beautiful and mesmerizing as a great piece of music or a new medical discovery or a great scientific discovery i mean you know going back to einstein he meditated in ways that like he would take these long walks he played the violin, and this is when he did most of his thinking because he was opening himself to something greater than his own mind, his own ego. He is opening himself to that greater mind. And I do think the mind is not something that's in our heads. I think it's something that is non-local, that is outside of, any one brain and that our brains are more like pianos or instruments that tune into certain frequencies from this infinite thing we call consciousness and glean from it powerful inspiration and ideas and the less you the less you focus in on one little thing or focus on that one little thing to the point of exhaustion and then in that exhausted moment you let go of everything then what you've been seeking begins to rush in but not not because you not because you found it it found you hmm. and that's 
that's the trick of the hermetic and the alchemical is that you you labor and you meditate and you pray and in that labor and meditation and prayer you reach a point of exhaustion where suddenly you let go and in letting go that which you have been seeking actually finds you because the best of life is not there to be found by us the best of life finds us yes yes uh, I, it's interesting you mentioned jazz music did you see the movie whiplash that just came out i did i thought that was what, what did you think about that because I, I felt like that movie was uh great on uh, in the initiatory process of being pushed to the breaking point by the mentor and then yes. transcending the mentor and then but completely the the old self like is completely gone at that point yeah your your mentor is actually a demon that <laughs> is tearing you to pieces and that becomes the foundation of your muse of your own inner voice that 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 comes out and expresses itself in a way that would have never happened otherwise hmm. do you feel like that process happens regardless of whether or not there's a literal physical mentor I think that I think that that process is something that um, is necessary towards evolution of your own nature and the nature of, of, of all of us as a collective I think that um, that being made uncomfortable brings out the best in us somehow as miserable as you are going through it at that moment when you come out the other side it actually you begin to see wow I, ne I really needed that that was really an essential part of my growth and of me finding what it is that I thought I was seeking in realizing that something even greater came into the picture without me even imagining that that was going to come mm. you're working on a novel right now mm. and uh if that's something you want to talk about in terms of how this how all of this plays into that and how that's a diff been different for you than the than filmmaking and how you're approaching that hmm i had a um i had a liver transplant in 2012 and after that what's what makes that incident so unique is that I was born genetically with a imperfect liver that was as it generated new cells those new cells were less perfect than the previous generation of cells so over time by the time I got into my 30s I was starting to get sick but in a very slow way that it was almost imperceptible and then by the time you know a few years passed i started to get started to get very sick but the point of why i bring this up is that there's something extraordinary when you realize that having nothing to do with diet having nothing to do with environment having nothing to do with anything that my liver that i was born with had a specific clock and it was meant to die in May of 2012. And that was it. What's interesting I about waking up from that surgery is that it really did become an alchemical rebirth, and it is directly related to what we're talking about. Because suddenly... 450 grams of my brother's left lobe of his liver is now alive as, and has grown to 1,600 grams of liver inside my body, making me healthier than I ever was in my entire life. The very physicalization of the spirit in that gesture 
is so profound, at least to me. And the idea of living beyond what nature had prescribed for me also was very profound in the sense that I felt that somehow through human generosity and genius of transplant medicine, I had lived beyond what nature had, had given me. And by doing this, I was no longer part of nature. That somehow I didn't belong to nature anymore. I didn't belong to time. I didn't belong to the cycles of things. And I even began to doubt my own position of the planets and the constellations at the moment of my physical birth, you know, um, years before. And now it was kind of like being born awake in a totally different way and understanding the loneliness of nature, if that makes any sense. How so? How so? That when you stand outside of nature and you look back at nature, you begin to see that nature itself emerged out of a great loneliness, that it was not something that was just there and meant to appear as it's presented in Genesis. And although I find Genesis quite beautiful, I think that the emergence of nature came out of something much more terrifying and in many ways much more beautiful. And that is what the novel begins to explore by presenting a cosmology as to how and why biology itself began to emerge and develop into life forms. And the nature and cycle of death and all these things are explored in the context of the novel. And I don't think the novel would exist without having been through the cataclysm of dying for a number of years, especially there was an eight and nine year period where I was very sick and okay. that led up to a series of surgeries that finally ended as a, uh, as a liver transplant. And so there's something in the process of slowly dying where you feel something within yourself begin to, to break or come apart and you become filled with this fear because it's such an unfamiliar thing going on within you. And that fear eventually levels off and disappears. And you're left with a new kind of perception within your body, within your cells, within your, your being. And I feel that an enormous amount of things began to be seen, knowledge apprehended through that experience. So I count that as one of the most important experiences of my life. And I feel that now I'm ready to really create, you know, on a level that I was always trying to get my head around, you know, years back. And now I feel like I see, I see all the pieces and I see how they all fit together as opposed to just seeing one or two pieces and seeing walls between those pieces. I feel like those walls have come down mm. through this experience and I'm, and I, I feel much more uh, able to articulate things that I didn't imagine being able to articulate previously. Mm. And you've used that, you've used that phrase a couple times of the walls coming down, both the walls we build around ourselves and 
now the walls that are perceived between disciplines or areas of knowledge is that what it's really do you think that you're uh, seeing things from a heightened perspective and the, the walls the walls just seem small uh, or is there you know certainly these these life passages or these life experiences bring the walls down for us they bring that's the, the key? they bring the walls down for us okay and to be honest between the hermetic the alchemical and the modern scientific world there really are no worlds it's just that the fears that exist on both sides of the fence keep those walls up if that makes sense it does it does and one of the most um, amazing things for me about studying the hermetic tradition is understanding it as a, a perspective as a way of looking at the world as a whole and seeing how everything fits together and that to understand the totality is to become closer to understanding the the creation or the mind or the will of god as manifested in everything around us and that really the only key to that is trying to see things as a whole or as you're saying you know, take in information from sources you wouldn't normally take in or listen to things that you wouldn't normally listen to or paintings you wouldn't normally see and try to understand everything as a totality. And I think that Hermeticism really has that that message specifically to offer us now as very compartmentalized, specialized, regimented modern people who are, many of us are stuck into roles or, or very small boxes and that people are increasingly encouraged to segment and segment themselves and become specialists in certain areas of knowledge and that if you're a scientist you cannot be interested in religion or mysticism or if you're an artist you cannot be interested in finance or and people are really pigeonholed into these roles and i think that particularly now where because of the internet we have immediate access at our fingertips to all collective human knowledge the hermetic worldview seems to me a very sane way to approach that information overload, mm. to see it as all fitting together. And I'm curious what you think the, tr the, the future of the hermetic tradition is, you know, going forward as, as, a, as, a, as a forward intellectual current. Well, I think it's, I think it's very much alive and well in, in this century especially when you look at something like the Hadron Collider, you know, or the CERN over in Switzerland, and you think about what's going on with this new discovery of particles that take us back to the very beginning of the universe and its formation. That is obviously an alchemical hermetic laboratory. The idea of finding the very first elements that began to move from radiation and energy into material, physical stuff with weight and measure is very much what the ancient philosophers have been chasing from Anaxagoras to all the way through to, uh, you know, Agrippa. And, uh, and also even in medicine, you see this cooperation that's becoming more common between Eastern holistic views of the body and of healing and Western views of, uh, of healing that the much more there's much more of a cooperative dynamic happening there than ever before um i find that incredibly encouraging and also the idea of these walls that we were speaking about earlier that i was talking about are becoming more blurred maybe they haven't disappeared but they're becoming more blurred and i think that any great scientist knows that there would be no eyes to see with or see through if they didn't have the hermetic 
in alchemical and magical traditions somewhere in their own being and cellular nature. They just don't talk about it. For a, a young person who is deeply called to doing what what you were talking about at when we first started talking of of following the as you said the kind of the the dictates of the unconscious or the imagery of the symbols coming out of their unconscious and whether that's in a a purely magical path or an artistic pursuit yet they may feel trapped by you know especially young people now trapped by student loans or trapped by their circumstances or a day job or the pe group of people around them kind of keeping them in a regimented role. What advice would you offer for somebody who really is yearning to follow that? I would say keep your life simple. Travel light. Don't accumulate a lot of things. And travel and build a library of personal experience as much and as vigorously that you can and um, and never stay too comfortable with what you know because always no matter how smart you are or how insightful you are that's always o only going to be a small fragment of the whole picture and as long as you know that you will you will you will pursue and follow your vision to the end and you will find that vision and then you will find it and as you find that vision you will follow it and as you follow that vision you will see that it has its own song its own reverie and you won't feel so alone but you need to move through a, an uncomfortable place to get to that point and as long as you understand while you're in that uncomfortable place that you're going to get through it and get to the other side and then you'll be able to feel that sense of connectivity with not only everything around you but everything that is within you you will gather more enthusiasm, more courage, and you will find that you're living a life worth living. Well, on that note, <laughs> that was, uh, that was, that was excellent. Thank you for, for sharing that, uh, uh, you know, for sharing your, your, your wisdom on all these, all these topics and the Hermetica and, and I'm sure we we could keep talking for a huge amount and cover all of the, uh, you know, just to begin to get into the books around us, for instance. But I think that, uh, I think that um, that is very beautifully summed up and and put. Well, it's my pleasure. Right, well, thank you for thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed that show, please help support the creation of new episodes by checking out magic.me, my online school for magic, where you can take online video trainings in magic, meditation, and mysticism. And if you go there now, there's even a ebook on chaos magic that you can download for the very low price of free. That's www.magick.me. Also, if you haven't yet, please make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes. And uh, I will see you next week for our next episode.